Okay, so I think we are recording. Um, so, my name is Cody Kratz. Um, I'm with uh, Valley Transportation Authority. This is Jordan Thompson with Digital Kidna. Uh, we're talking about some user-centered and user-focused customer experience design today. So this is gonna be one of the less technical talks you guys have been going to. We're developer, um, developer-driven talks. I won't be able to do that, and a lot of this is things I'm gonna share, so. Um, whether that's a breath of fresh air or you know, boring, I, I hope I hope it's I hope it's a little bit of um, I guess just some some exposure to some, the other side of things if you guys are developers. So, um, like I said, I'm, I'm with BTA. I'm our administrator of digital communications. I manage our website and some other web programs. I do social media program as well as um, email and other kinds of digital communications. Um, I'll introduce BTA in a minute. And uh, my name is Jordan Thompson. I'm a technical lead at uh, Digital Kidna, so I, I kind of in charge of the, the technical solutions on a project. I lead all that kind of development uh, workflow. I'm, I'm kind of that bridge between the, the client and like our developers, and kind of make sure that everything's flowing well, and um, we're using the right tools. So VTA, um, I don't know if you guys are from the area or not, but we are in the South Bay, Santa Clara County, which is actual Silicon Valley. We're a valley, so. We actually are Silicon Valley, geographically. Um, we provide, we're independent special districts, so we're a local government agency. Um, we're not a city, we're not a county, we're a special district. And we, our slogan is solutions that move you. So we not only provide public transit service, bus and light rail, uh, paratransit, but we also do a lot of planning regionally. We pass through a lot of funding from the federal and state regional government down to the, the local cities. We actually have 15 cities within our jurisdiction, and so we, we serve a lot of their needs. They range from highways to bicycle and pedestrian um, to certain kinds of land use planning. We're also a landowner, so we're trying to build transit-oriented development, transit-oriented communities. And if any of you have come over on BART here in the, in the Bay Area, we're actually extending, we're building the BART stations. We built the, the Milpitas and um, North San Jose stations already, hoping to open them very soon. By the end of this year is the goal. And then we're going to be building the, the stations that extend far into downtown San Jose and Santa Clara. We do a lot of different things. So, uh, so I'm from Digital Echidna. So Echidna is pronounced E Echidna as opposed to like Echinacea or Enchilada. We get that a lot from, from people who don't know how to say that. Because uh, so what an Echidna is is actually this Australian animal right here. It's kind of like a porcupine. It's like an anteater. So this is kind of unique. Um, Web, so, Digital Kidna is a web services agency in London, Ontario, Canada. Um, we have about 85 uh, employees. Uh, we have about six grand masters, which is really cool. Lots of certifications. Um, and we're active in the Drupal community. We have a, a few uh, really high uh, contributors. We have a few core committers as well, so it's pretty, pretty neat. Uh, yeah. Uh, so. We're going to talk a bit about um, really like, like the, the title describes you know, the customer experience. Um, at certain points, um, I'll have Jordan talk about some more technical aspects of that. Um, but our goals really, when, when we chose to work with Digital Kid on redesigning our website, were improve that user satisfaction. We weren't seeing that we had a, an abysmal rating or anything like that, um, but we always thought we could do better. We wanted to move from Salesforce, which was our CRM system and also was hosting our previous website to an open source platform that would give us more flexibility. Um, had a, had some more responsiveness to it, but we wanted to be even more responsibly designed, very mobile first, and um, leverage some transit industry uh, data standards I'll get into in a minute. Um, and then we also have a, our vendor portal for vendors to find out about procurements is also on Salesforce, so we need to rebuild that. Um, some of our so you're trying to get totally off Salesforce? Not the CRM portion, okay. we, we stay on, that's what Salesforce is best for, but um, you know, it may have been the right decision at the time to, to choose Salesforce to host the website. It's very uncommon and um, obviously there are more purpose-built platforms for that, like Drupal. So this is actually our old website. Um, you know, I want to make, make clear, we're not saying it, w it was horrible and everyone hated it. I think people get used to things, and there were aspects of this that people really liked as well. Um, and we wanted to retain aspects of it that people were either accustomed to or that were working well while making that transition and um, improving on it. One of the biggest things we, we really tried to do was streamline it and, and cut down how much information was there. 
see our six tabs across the top. Um, and actually, I'll just jump to the, this next slide. The, the biggest challenge we've had with our website over the years is that its design and functionality were very internally driven, very you know, internal power dynamics and you know, who has influence um, internally. And there's really no, there's no understanding, not only of what the metrics are, like of Google Analytics, but no one really knows that there is Google Analytics, that you could find out you know, how much traffic each page on your website gets. And perhaps some of them don't want to know because it, they might figure it wouldn't be advantageous. But that was kind of a, a big challenge for us to work through. It, 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 I'm certainly not saying that some of the long tail content, you know, the things that um, are that get very little traffic, but they aren't extremely important because often they are. You know, there might be a page about our six billion dollar tax measure that we manage that gets very little traffic. That doesn't mean that that six billion dollar tax measure or you know, some some five hundred million dollar project isn't as important as when's the next bus going to get here to me right now, or what's the schedule for that for that route. Um, it's just more a matter of just understanding the amount of traffic um, that each piece of content is getting. And that wasn't something that was front and center for, for most of our internal audiences. So I'll talk through how we tried to change that. Um, and it led to a lot of fighting for the home page and the menu. And let's add another tab and let's add more you know, items to the menu and then kind of satisfy the internal, um, you know, the, the internal users that, that wanted their stuff front and center. The other big challenge we have is just we're a government agency, so we don't have unlimited resources. No one does, but we're probably even more limited um, than a private company might be. Uh, we have a lot of different stakeholders externally as well. Um, they have different comfort levels with technology. They have different political motivations. Uh, so we had to balance all of that as well. And then there is a, has anyone heard of GTFS? You know, know anything about transit data? We won't dive deep into this, but it's very important to this process of so general transit feed specifications. When you open Google Maps and you see schedules and all that stuff in there, that's because Google invented many years ago general transit feed specifications. And they have since built on it a real-time data standard that is kind of based on that data. You probably won't dive. Well, Jordan might describe it a little bit. Um, so the approach we took really was trying to be user-centered and data-driven and convince our internal stakeholders to do that. We'll also talk a little bit about the microservices strategy. Forgive me if I'm not using that perfectly right, but to me that means let's not have this website do everything. Let's see what other specialized tools there are out there that we could link off to or leverage or integrate. And then an iterative process that has helped us tell people we're, we're not done, so don't, you know, let us keep moving forward um, because there's always opportunity to change. Nothing's ever perfect. And then we've also provided a lot of training. Um, you know, people didn't know about how to create good web content. They would just kind of write for themselves a lot of times, large chunks of text, um, not a lot of awareness of accessibility requirements, things like that. Uh, so the, the um, let me just take it from here. So our kind of approach was a, a little more technical. Um, we did a lot of research in uh, kind of what, what other transit authorities were doing and kind of saying, you know, what was working, what was not working. Kind of like you know, surveying the field and, and see what everyone's using it. But while like trying to kind of keep up to standards, but also trying to innovate at the same time. So saying like you know if that's really working for them, so maybe we can kind of do something similar, maybe we can make it better. Um, so we have a few features that we kind of like you know. Oh, go ahead. You keep talking about working and not working. You know, learning from others. Yep. How do you know it's working? Are, are you looking at data? Um, are you looking at surveys? We kind of like we took some features and. We kind of went through um, and said, you know, like, is this intuitive? Like, does it make sense? And we even implemented a few of those in our um, user testing, which we'll get to in a little bit. So we kind of implemented those and see, can real people actually use this? And if it doesn't work for them, then maybe we need to kind of switch the way we're doing something. So um, we did have a lot of, like, good user testing for that um, so that we could see real time that, like, you know, oh, yeah, they don't understand how this interface works. Maybe we need to redesign it a little bit or maybe we need to switch to something else. Um, we'll get into that a lot. Yeah. But, but when you talk to other transit agencies, oh, we saw what they were using. That wasn't uh, part of, that wasn't as much a part of this process. Okay. We didn't talk to them, we just kind of like saw what was out there. Okay. So, um, and then we uh, we used Drupal 8, of course, and we used um, some of the Drupal 8 uh, functionality, like Layout Builder, we, we leveraged a lot to make that uh, content a little more dynamic, a little more pop. Um, and we had some of our own custom functionality as well. 
uh, with uh, incorporating that GFS standard. So you can kind of see how complex this standard is. It has uh, about 10 different files that it kind of has all these different relationships to, and they all kind of matter. So like, you know, I have stops, I have routes, they all kind of feed into each other. Uh, it's pretty complicated. Um, so that kind of that took a while to wrap our heads around. Um, we had some migration from the, the old Salesforce to the, the new site as well. So integrations with those microservices that we'll kind of touch upon a little bit later. And then, you know, just kind of working with ETA to, to make sure that we're delivering what they want and uh, having like our uh, weekly meetings to make sure that you know, we're, we're getting everything and, and kind of getting all the feedback. And then, so about those microservices, so we did leverage a few APIs. So for, um, we did some Google Maps APIs. So on our front page, we have um, like a trip planner. So it actually calls Google Directions. And so our Google Places to get the places for an autocomplete, and then Google Directions to actually give you those results like you would do in Google Maps, which is really cool. Um, our Swiftly API is for our real-time uh, bus arrivals. So we can actually, if someone says, when's my next bus coming, I can get to this API and they'll say, oh yeah, it's going to be coming in the next five, ten, five minutes. And then our Mechatran API is as far as service alerts, so that um, we can get service alerts for our routes. So if, say, a bus is down, the stop's moved, that kind of fuels that, and we kind of connect to that, and grab it, and display it on the website. And uh, these others are, are really a list of the things that we decided to say we're not building that into the website. In fact, our, our board office, for example, our board secretary's office is uploading the agenda for the next board meeting both to a board dedicated board portal like that does a lot of things like including streaming the the meetings um, as well as to our website. They were duplicating effort. They were just creating events in both of them and uploading documents in both. So we just said let's rely on that. If that's not good, that's a whole separate conversation. Like that's not solve the fact that we have a bad board meeting portal with build you know duplicating all of that functionality. Um, so it's a waste. So we just kind of put the pressure back on those and some of them are great and some of them need need to be improved. One of the other things we did, we, we have endorsed the Transit app, I don't know if you guys use that uh, actually out of Canada. Um, they, they, have, they do a really good job of a focused app about transit trip planning and we found that our, our customers, our riders really like it. So that's how we've answered the call that we continuously get is like, you guys should build a web app, you know, a, or a, a native app and look at the, their venture backing is like $10 million and all right, yeah, if, you get, if we can get $10 million, I guess we could try to compete, but why? Why do that? So that's kind of been our approach, so we just focus on what we have to do. Um, and this might start to answer some of your questions about how we, I guess you were asking how we got information from other transit agencies. We, we really didn't want to talk to other transit agencies because what works well in Boston doesn't necessarily work in Santa Clara County, okay? So, we did a user survey up front. We did a broad one. We did some more specialized ones. Um, we obviously delved into Google Analytics. And rather than just keep all that to ourselves, we realized that it was very important to make sure everyone in the agency, as they talk around this, about this around the water coolers, understood all that. So this is actually a poster that we put up all over the agency. And in our workplace, that's how you get the word out a lot of times. It's just kind of physical physical displays um, and we, we just tried to make sure people understood that. Yep. Where'd you guys how did you get funding to do this part? I think this is sort of like pre implementation, so it's like Yeah. You know, did at that point was the agency totally bought into the fact that this needed to be done so they you already had the budget for it? Or did this yeah. was a justified budget like no, the budget was there, and this was spent out of the budget that, been in, that had been approved. Um, I'm not so sure that top decision makers understood, and they don't know how much it costs to make a website, frankly. So I don't think they understood that you know, how much of the time would be spent on things like this. A lot of this, though, really was my time, so I, I did all of this, and our in-house designers developed this. So to be honest, we didn't probably have to spend a whole lot of time uh, we'll get to some things that have that had hard costs, but this is this was really existing um, in-house resources. Mostly. Uh, we we just also did a lot of socializing to top executives. They they're the ones that made the decision make the decisions. So we kind of a bottom up like, hey boss, who would who on your team would you like to work closely with us? And that's a little more of like a not very bottom up, but kind of middle up. And then we would meet the top executive, including our general manager. She said she wants a button moved. We move the button, you know, unless it's, it's, it's a, a horrible idea. And, and socializing it through all of those audiences really helped. This is actually an example of one of the most important charts we shared with executives. 
this stopped a lot of conversation about how, you know, mainly people are coming to get information about our financials. Heard that from someone, well, I have to kind of bite my tongue. You know, that's not true, obviously. So, it, it's, and, it's, and it shouldn't be surprising, but I think it was surprising to the people who do this. I think to them, that's the world. And I understand that, totally respect that. Not saying these things aren't important. In fact, this is where a lot of our money gets spent. Hundreds of millions of dollars get spent right here. And we just don't engage a lot of people on it. That's just kind of the nature of the business. But this is what people are coming to our homepage for, by and large. Uh, and they're coming on mobile. That was also something I don't think people realize, because that's not how our, our internal staff gets onto our website. They do it at work, they get on, on there, and maybe when they're gonna find a transit trip, they'll get transit apps. So they just don't think about this stuff. So these charts, simple charts, seem to help a lot. We also fed all of that into some user personas. That was also done in-house, so no, no cost, um, no hard costs. We had four different kinds of transit rider personas, just to underscore that you know, half of the eight were transit riders. And then the advocate and interested community member, these are the people who are generally interested in those projects. These are the people who are really interested in those projects, are coming to our board of directors meetings, things like that. Um, we wanted to make sure that we, we put them really high up because this, this group needs um, some really important content around, around the, the big bucks we're spending on capital projects. Things that are affecting them, you know, construction and things like that. And then prospective employees and vendors is a kind of a tertiary group. Yep. So regarding these personas, you said uh, these were development houses. I mean, all the research that went into understanding these user types was all done in-house as well, or, or? Yep, the Google Analytics. I mean, I think we, we did a lot of back and forth. Like I said, hey, here's what I got. You know, you, know, you guys seeing anything different here, anything I'm missing? Am I right that it's this extreme? You know, am I reading this right? Um, and then the user survey, you know, doing something on social media. Just kind of fed it all together. Um, there is some data here that is, it, some of it's kind of pulling from like Pew Internet and American Life as well, um, census. I mean, we, we do a lot of research on customer segments as well. So the four different transit rider personas are different customer segments. And that's coming from our onboard survey. We have a lot of other data. We so have. it sounds like you have a pretty mature in-house design and research team. You're doing all this stuff. Sure. We're getting, we're, we're getting there. This was, this was a big, this was a huge step up. Um, we've never done anything like this before. And we have now been leveraging it for a lot of other projects. So it really changed the conversation. You know? the visuals make it more really sure. That was what we realized is that like, put, you know, it's, a, it's kind of amazing. Like you go into a conversation and you know, be like, well, this is, the, this is the truth. This is reality. Say, okay, but I have this chart. And like, well, yeah, but, oh, but I have this graphic. Look how pretty it is, right? How could this be wrong? Like, look at the colors, and then they, they kind of yeah, stop talking. I don't, I don't really say it like this, but it, but it does, I guess that's a, a point I want to make, is like this stuff made a difference. I, I, I expected it would. I know what sells internally, at least, in our organization. Probably true everywhere. Once you've taken the time to make it look this pretty, it must be true. And fortunately, it really is. Like, this is real data. Like I said, we, we had some stuff behind it. But it becomes a little, a little impressionistic when you get to this point. And so we weren't saying, like, this is exactly what every one of these people is like. But when you want to sit down and we want to have a debate about who we're designing for and what they need, let's go back to these and think about this. Um, we tested our navigation. So you'll see in a minute, we only have three tabs, if you will, where we had six before. I knew that was going to be a big, big challenge because some people care about those other three and all of the, the 20 links within each one of them. <laughs> and we, we really had to prove and validate through a couple of iterations actually that, that this was gonna work and it, and it did hold that up. Um, support that, that we could simplify in that way. Even though some people were saying very, very vocally, this is horrible, I hate it. The fact is you know, 70, 80, 90% of people like it or not, they find what they're looking for. We don't care if you it's not so much whether you like it, it's whether or not you can find what you're looking for. Uh, we did two rounds of usability testing. We hired a, a local firm called UE Group to do one-on-one -on -one testing just to give us some distance and we watched them go through uh, first to what? Some static wireframes in you know, Envision. Um, I didn't actually put that logo on there, but Envision that, uh, was a useful tool for us for that prototyping. And then mostly we're just getting four or five star, like really high, high ratings from these reviewers so we kept moving forward. Uh, the second one was on our public beta, but we wanted to just sit down and watch them go through it and see where they struggled. We learned a lot from this. 
we got a lot of validation from it. We made some course correction. And I want to say it was, it was, it was pretty uh, interesting as well because we kind of watched these together. So like he came from the, the more transit side of like, you know, like I understand the data and I'm coming from a more functional side. So I'm like, I know how they should be using it, but maybe they're not understanding how to use it, for example. So it was a kind of interesting contrast so that we were kind of both kind of collaborating ideas and saying, oh, maybe we should like, you know, improve this little piece and, you know, make it better for, for kind of both worlds. So. And, and to your question, this did have a hard cost. This was a a chunk of change that we had to put in the contract. I think each each round is maybe twelve or fifteen thousand, something like that. So it's kind of it's not a huge amount of money. You could certainly spend a lot more than that on this kind of research. But um, we found a way to make it pretty manageable. Like they didn't do a whole lot of analysis for it for us. For example, I mean, I, we were watching the whole time. I, I felt comfortable drawing the conclusions that we needed to draw from it. But I, I think it was like it was thorough enough that you got a lot of good feedback. Um, the, uh, the iterative process has also helped, you know, letting people know as we went through the process that this isn't the last chance to kind of weigh in, but it is your last. This, this is, we're, we're talking to you about, with you about this before we move to that next phase, and so if we need to change anything, now is the time. Um, and that really helped, I think, executives feel more comfortable letting us move to that next phase and letting us move forward and, you know, hold up the process and, um, Feel like it was their, their only chance before everyone was locking us down. Uh, it probably saves some money, saves some time, and it's good to make course corrections. Uh, this is just kind of a, a summary I actually should, should have put uh, Envision on here, but the surveys, I mean, we were using you know, your standard tool, Google Analytics and SurveyMonkey. We actually found Hotjar to be a, a useful tool for putting a pop up on the website as well as feedback as well as recording actual site visits. So it's a really cool tool. So like where on your page someone's focusing, which is really neat. Where do they click? And, yeah. Um, and then a lot of internal presentations. And I don't know what kinds of organizations you're in, but that, that's uh, probably important in a, in a lot of large organizations where you have different different tiers of stakeholders to get buy-in from. The, the one on one usability testing, there are ways to do that for, for free and cheap. And for other projects, that's what, what I've done. Um, you can do it just using Zoom and other kinds of tools like that that let you do it either moderated or unmoderated. Um, but that was also really helpful in making, um, whenever at every stage we were able to come back to the executives and the liaisons group and say, it, it was always, it was never, hey, what do you think about this? Do you, do you like it? It was never that question. You're like, all right, so our, our, our testing, this is what our testing told us. It told us, you know, we, we needed to improve this, so we did, just, you know. To some degree, we're, we're soliciting input from them just to make sure we didn't miss anything, but it always came with that statement that we did test this with our real users. Um, so if, if you think they're wrong, well, let's talk about it. But um, in previous website redesigns, that was not part of the conversation at all. TreeJack is actually uh, part of a company called Optimal Workshop. It's just one of their, their products. Um, so. The launch was, was pretty strong for our core content, the, the transit content that gets the most traffic. We'll speak to one area where we had to make some changes. It's a little rockier for some of the long tail content, you know, creating project pages, migrating certain really obscure but very important documents over was a real challenge from our old um, previous document storage. Um, the Amazon stuff went smoothly. The Salesforce storage stuff was a little harder, just how it worked out. But we got through it. Um, this is uh, kind of side by side. You know, you see, it, it's not. I mean, we have some of the same things there. We just have cut away some of the fat, some of the things that weren't needed. We, we found, um, and so far that's been helped. That's been validated. The um, which is just a little, little bit of a walkthrough of the real time functionality we put at the very front, and just behind that, the trip planner functionality. Again, we're not reinventing the wheel. These are just pulling in from different data sources, um, and. The, um, you know, so far the analytics has shown that, yeah, it was, it was I mean, even just like, which tab do you put first? Should it be trip planner first or should it be real time? That was an internal debate. And so that empathy with like, well, every time one of these personas opens this website, what are they most likely doing? Planning a fresh trip from A to B that they've never done before? No, they're, they know where they're going. They just need to know when they're going. So um, the route pages are really get the most traffic, even more than real time and trip planner. Yeah. Did you guys like, do anything where you set cookies so if they came back, you left the tab open? We are going to get into our next phase on our roadmap into more personalization. 
Um, that might be part of it. I think we're also looking at ways to make it a little more, um, a little more intentional by them. So I, I think we still need to finish scoping that out exactly how that will work. Whether they will remember what they did last or whether they will uh, tell it to remember. Yeah, but right now we don't have any, anything like that. The, um, this is actually something that had to change a lot. Um, a lot, but, but a pretty substantial change to the UI. So previous, previously when we, we first transitioned, instead of these tabs, we had kind of a series of, of buttons that they would select and they would click submit. And that really was more clicks than we had previously. It was, we ultimately concluded, too many clicks. And so we simplified it. We went back to something that's a little more like what we had previously and just made it faster, more performant. Um, and people were a lot happier and our ratings went up. So that's just an example of how you, you know, you don't always nail it the first time. We told people that was going to internally that was going to be the case. And then we fixed it as quickly as we could. And a uh, cool tech note, so that all that G2S standard is um, fueling this table and all these tabs and anything in here. So even you can even do trip planning on a tab mm -hmm. with in internally. So like all of this is fed in and kind of like we, we kind of ingest it and kind of format it in a certain way so that we can kind of use it a little better. And then we feed it into the table. So all that information is on there as opposed to being like a hard coded table or anything like that. It's all being used uh, and uh, from like a really robust structure. Yeah, and a, lo a lot of things we're trying to do with this site, we're trying to automate and simplify it. So all those fees we're talking about, those are not just used by the website. The website led us to launch a service alerts feed, open feed, for example, but we're going to use that all over the place so our employee can do that just have one place to enter instead of four, or actually seven, but they don't do the other three because it's too time right? So a lot of, a lot of efforts like that. Um, this is a project page. We learned from the research that the timeline or the when is very is most important to people. As soon as they know what this thing is, which if they're on the, the page, that they already have a general sense of what and where. Um, but when's it going to be impacting me with construction? When's it going to be done? That's what people want. So we invested quite a bit of time and effort into this timeline feature. Here, you know? And uh, we try to make it very visual because it is very important. And a lot of times you see a timeline, and you're like, oh yeah, we did this, this, and this, but it's. Sometimes it's more like kind of a more boring, if you will, kind of content to look at. We try to make it a little more visually engaging. We have that kind of you know linear flow down, and then they can dive into each kind of uh, phase and see you know oh we have had a blog about this or there's a little bit of like you know we did this then so it kind of engages you saying you know, we're actively doing things and, and this is where you can kind of read more about it. And a lot of things. One thing I like about how we approach projects is there are a lot of different content. You know, chunks of content, pieces of content that are related to others, and that's really allowed us to maybe be a lot more efficient and just serialize content throughout the website. I don't think we've fully appreciated yet how useful that's going to be because we are still adding more content to the site. So each new project that starts up and the first time we introduce it to people on this website, I think our, our community outreach team is probably starting to be exposed to the, the benefits of that, asking the questions like, how do I do this, how do I do that? And I think the answers are, are typically things that are going to save them time and give users a much better experience. So excited about that as well. Um, question on that, taking the question on, yeah. on the structure. There are just so many wonderful components or parts of that. Is that custom all the way, or is um, that built on a module? Or so, if I wanted to, if I broke this down a little bit, um, so these are all using custom entities. So these. Uh, higher bits are project phases, which are a custom entity. And then we have the milestones inside of those, which they contain uh, those custom entities as well. And there's even some, it's kind of just something cool to note, is that there's some validation. So you can specify, say, construction runs from two, to 2019 to 2020. And then it won't actually let you make a milestone inside without making sure it's in that date. Because why would you put like a 2021 inside of the milestone phase that doesn't actually exist? There's some some kind of like kind of nice complexities in there that just kind of make everything work better. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's just using uh, like custom entities, and we can we can talk about that after two months. It's a session on two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all about custom entities. All right. Um, so this is, and I'm all about you know charts and <laughs> good ratings that I can take to management. So the bottom line is that, um, and I highlight all three of these because you know you're never going to get. I mean, I don't know, five star ratings. Like there's, there are people who just don't feel like, I'd give it five stars, but I just don't give things five stars, which means your four star is a five star, right? And um, so after we made those changes I described to the route pages, we did this hot jar pop up survey again, 
And this is this is what I wanted to see was the the, the, the bell curve, you know, that was um, that distribution was across the four stars, and that's where we landed. We still have things, you know, some people who are very unhappy, and we may always, um, but that is. Um, you know, pulls, our, pulls down the average a little bit, but we, you know, so we'll keep listening to patterns and feedback and seeing what we can improve. I also think that to some degree, people get used to things. I don't, I don't lean on that a whole lot, but it is true for, for folks who are maybe a little less comfortable with technology. That is you know, sometimes what it takes, just some time using it, and the next time they come back, it's a little easier, and the next time it's a little easier. Whereas we have a lot of um, like college students that use our website, and good or bad, they'll figure it out, right? So I, that's what I don't want. Like just because they're, just because they find it easy doesn't, you know, we're trying to, trying to walk that balance where um, all users are finding it pretty easy. Maybe it takes a couple of times um, to, uh, to, to get there, but eventually this, um, hopefully we, we kind of see everything centering over here. I was actually excited to see five stars and you know, some good feedback like this. Work kind of at time, but I'll just mention on our roadmap is personalization. Um, actually, I shouldn't say at time. We're at, we're at my internal marker for um, some Q&A. Uh, we're never done, so this is actually our, like our Trello board where we have, you know, these are, these are things that I, I drop in there or that people have requested, you know, like I want to be able to print my trip plan. Okay, you know, that's something we can probably do, and then eventually as, as um, we've moved you know, more of the, the work in progress over to being done, we'll start prioritizing them and moving them forward. But the big chunk is going to be personalization um, as well as some email uh, service alerts that we're going to build into the website. And I found, too, that we, we kind of took a phased approach to this project as well. So saying, you know, we had a lot we wanted to redesign and kind of take over from the whole website, but there's a lot of, like, extra features that we can kind of build on because we have that we're on Drupal now. We can do a little more custom stuff. But, you know, we can't always fill that in before launch. So we kind of said, you know, this is all our must-haves. And then... We hit a phase two, we can still keep going because we're never done. We can always be looking at uh, user surveys and saying, you know, maybe we should fix the, those tabs and make them a little better. Even though, like, you know, original design, we really liked it internally, but users are getting it, so we can always keep kind of fixing that. I actually really like the idea of having buckets of things you must do, things you should do, things you could do, things you shouldn't do. You know, and and our, actually, our user research UE group kind of force people to put things in those buckets because otherwise you start asking people questions and they kind of treat all the coulds as if they are must. They don't, they don't differentiate. And now you have all these cool ideas, you just can't do them all. Um, and that just forced us to, to discipline on that. And that really is the, kind of how we phased it. We did what we must do. And now we're moving to even some coulds. I mean, personalization, no, one, no one's demanding that of us. So they don't even notice it's not there yet. It gives us some time to work on it. So my question is, um, when you took this to your board, and you know, people want, like it seemed like you guys were one of those good examples of like the org chart was represented in the menu, for example. So it's like, we want our department stuff like right there. So did you guys have to decide what the mission of the site was first? Or did you say based on traffic and user data that says like people are coming to my trips, we're just gonna focus the mission on sort of helping well, I think, and actually that's something Digital Kidna helped us with, with establish um, a mission statement. And I think at that stage, we didn't have enough information. And so it was, the mission statement was that it would be centered on our users, like user-centered and data-driven. And we got buy-in from top management on that. Yeah, so. From our general manager and CEO. Okay. Like, that, was, that was one of the very first things we did is like, she said that. And they always say, remember, you know, your manager will, General manager, you know, wants us to be doing something user-centered. So, yes. and then after that, we just had to now. Now we have to do the research, mm -hmm. and then we're and we have to make sure we do it well and analyze it well and draw valid conclusions, and then socialize those around. That, that kind of answer your question. Yeah, because it, it sort of gives you this flexibility to know other people. It's like, well, the mission is the user focused. And mm -hmm. Our users are, and yeah. they didn't necessarily buy into that. I mean, it it really took the one of the one of the most powerful currencies in our organization is um, our general manager's name is Nuria Fernandez. Nuria, Nuria said, <laughs> any sentence that starts with that, you know, but you don't want to overuse it. And, but, so we got that buy-in and um, it really helped. And actually, you put it really well, the org chart was the, the menu. Like, that is how we would have 
uh, other than in the absence of this, in a vacuum, that is exactly how it's done. All right, you need a tab for this department, you can a link for that department, um, just like our intranet. Well, that's, our, that's your intranet, but that's not your... And we, we did kind of take those like user personas and that kind of information to try to design like, you know, if someone's hitting a website on their first kind of glance, you know, that's where all that, that trip information, that, that transit stuff, that kind of the top. But if you scroll down a little bit, there's more of the, the blog area for those advocates and that kind of secondary or tertiary kind of group. So we do make sure that like our, our personas are kind of satisfied in order, if you will. So you make sure that, you know, if I'm here for transit, I have enough information right up front for transit. Um, and then, you know, like, if I'm an advocate, projects aren't too far away, my blogs aren't too far away, like, but they're, they're still not the, the big thing in your face at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that was kind of a, an important piece to just to make sure that, you know, if I was a transit rider, I don't want to see the projects in my face. I want to see, I want, I want to get my next bus real quick, like right now. And we, so, we actually, you can't, you can't see it here, but this is like for the vendor and the potential uh, employee, which is extremely important. I mean, we need to get, we spend tons of money with vendors, we spend tons of money, you know, a lot of money on employees, and so we want to get good quality and quantity. I think it also helps people understand, like, we're, like that, it's not just all about transit, because I'm in, like, the customer service and marketing group, like, I, we want that group, too. Um, but, yeah, there is a balance to kind of satisfy. Yeah, because it's like, when you say user-focused, it's like, well, which users, though? So, right. and then do you base it off like the users that contribute the most money to the BTA, which yeah. is like, yeah. who are actually writing, or is it like, you know? It was, it was, yeah, I think that the data when we, when we were looking at it was like, most people are coming here to figure out when they should take the next bus, for example. They're not coming here to necessarily look at projects, but there is still a large chunk that cares about projects. Mm -hmm. So that we, that we have to make sure, you know, like, these are the people we need to really satisfy. And of our top row is that like those are the ones we really need to hit on, and then like we still need to keep these guys in mind, but they're not as our upfront as, as the rest of them. So, some other things that were um, not very familiar to people was the importance of Google and search. I don't think any. So I, I probably shared some charts like this that just showed it depends on the content, but you know, 60, 70 percent of your traffic is coming from search, and then I didn't even count you know site search, right? So um, things like that I think helped help them understand um, that, you know, I, I think they would say, well, but we, we need to get them more aware of these projects we're doing. And, you know, they didn't quite so understand that, that shoving it in front of people's face isn't going to accomplish that. You know, putting it on the home page, I mean, maybe it helps a little bit, but it's, that's not where they're going to get there anyway. It's not going to change anything. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked, we did some training about SEO and, mm -hmm. and search engine optimization and introducing people to that. Yeah. I'm curious to know how and where or if you incorporated uh, accessibility concerns, guidelines, and testing into this process. Good question. So we we definitely focused on this these groups these personas initially, and you'll notice like there's not a there's not a persona that says you know people with disabilities or seniors, and politically like political correctness wise, that's not cool, right? Um, we always knew we were going to uh, adhere to WCAG um, 2.0 level AA. That's our we have a policy for that. It's our government, we're going to do it. Um, so after we had done a lot of our work, we actually we had a firm go and evaluate it. You know, Digital Kinda did, did their stuff. We had a, a third party come in and validate all of that and identify things that need to be changed. And then you went back in and. Um, yeah, there's like you know, a little bit that's like, oh, hey, we've got that RE attribute over here, so let's, you know. There's one outstanding issue that we, we still need to address around some accordions, um, but we took care of all the, like the high and, and medium ones, and that, that's kind of the only real thorny one we still need to sort out. So I think all, the other thing is we're going to continue doing that as we go forward um, because so much more content gets added to the website. Um, you know, all of our um, documents that are, have been uploaded for years are not accessible. I just this week got Acrobat DC installed on my computer instead of X, you know, X or whatever. So just we, went, we just went through some training internally. So a lot of this is um, it's belated, but we're getting there, and it's gonna. You know, I, I've I've drawn a line in the sand. Like now that I have the software to test whether your thing is accessible or not, I'm gonna do it. And if it's not, then I don't upload it. And, and 
Well, when we, you, you decide that, what happens next. When we took that like accessibility, like and, and taking a look at that, we were also trying to make sure that individual components are accessible. So as you know, we we're making those dynamic layouts. It doesn't matter what you're using; they're all going to be accessible all the time. So that was kind of our approach as well. So like you know, even though we are missing that accordion because we're still using like the uh, like detailed list or, or the like a DL list or whatever, it isn't accessible. So we're trying to change that to more of a detailed element. Uh, but even something like that. If those are all being used on the website, then they're all good to go. Right. We also increase font sizes here. Little simple things like that. Yeah. So they have your standard in mind. Mm -hmm. from the very beginning. And that was part of our con I'm sorry, I just yep. pointed that pointed a laser at him. That was part of our contract, really was you know and part of our procurement process. Um, I don't think we knew at early on you know, what that was gonna mean. I mean we didn't know like what labels are we putting on things, we don't know what the things are yet, right? So I thought I think that was a pretty good um, process. You know, I think if we worked with a vendor that just was hoping we would like, forget about that part or something like that, then you know maybe it would have been a little more jarring to course correct later. But they knew they had agreed to that, and you know, they um, I think appreciated having the the, the second round. Yeah. Um, when you have these like 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 big swaths of your website. You're so heavily search driven, like you were sort of describing. The long tail. How did that feed back into discussions about what should be on the home page? It's obviously like it helps you, like maybe remove some things, but mm -hmm. doesn't this like? How do you then decide like what people are actually like use from there? And just as an example, like we recently like kind of went over looking towards revamping Microsite we have for current students at our university, mm -hmm. but it's not their primary resource area, so it's like they're all hitting it just when they're searching for certain things. Okay. And we found like, you know, ninety seven percent of them are coming in somewhere that's not the home page. But mm. the part is, you know, the, the people in the institution are still really worried about what's on the home page. Yeah, that's usually how that's how it is, you know, is that um, the internal users have a, they're very accustomed to a, you go here and you click this and you click that. Like in our instructions to vendors, I've watched, even when you've launched our new vendor portal, they want to write out the step-by-step -step instructions, the click path, to get to this procurement that we just released. When the, the channel that they're distributing that text in could accommodate a, a link. Right, so so, but they're accustomed to like describing that click path. And that might sound a little different, but I think it's related. It's that, mm -hmm. that all I can say is like this kind of socializing. It's a it's a process. It's like um, showing them data about you know people getting there from Google, and I guess convincing them that that's not a bad thing, especially if your audience is college students. And I, I think too, it also falls back to writing good web content because mm -hmm. if if they can find it from Google, then they you don't necessarily have to make them jump through ten hoops of menu get to their content. So I do know the landing page is super important, or the home page is super important, but it's, as it, you know, it's not the, eat that, sorry. It's not the only way people get to your website. Mm -hmm. So I need some like, training about that too. Like yeah. that's not your, it's just one tool in the toolbox. Like, you know, if someone comes to the website for the first time, you know, maybe they figure out where all the menus are, but then they're like, oh yeah, I'm always gonna go to project because that's the only thing I care about. And then maybe they even favor that page and then go to the home page again, which is fine because now they know where they're going. And we also had something where we could, I mean, I could show people, you know, all these links here, and I can, I can tell you how many people go to those pages, period, mm -hmm. and I can tell you how many of them, like how they got there. So, so there were con some convincing arguments to say that, in spite of your effort to put it on the homepage and drive traffic to it from the homepage, like that didn't work. We did it. We've done it for years. It hasn't achieved what you thought it would achieve, which is that people click on that link or that button. In fact, in, it still, regardless, they get there from Google. So, if we took it away, would it change that at all? I mean, or would would it be negligible? Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's you know, it's like you said, the data proves what the users are doing. I guess. If yeah, people accept that. Those two metrics side by side, which maybe we haven't done. Like, people are looking at your existing navigation on the home page. Remove the entire navigation from the pages. 
Yeah, Google. Who here? Who, do, do, do you use Google Analytics? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, that's just, it's a gold mine. I mean, it's like a superpower to, in these conversations because you're talking with someone that doesn't know Google Analytics exists. Right? Yeah. Right? But they don't even know that someone, that you could do that. They just go off of intuition, their gut. Did you have to prove that it was a valid source of data to those people? And, and that's why I said, like, if, if they accept data, I mean, we have some people who, if like they're just so, exactly. I've had a lot of conversations over the years because I've been very data focused. And I've had people, it's so fr aggravating, like, well, you can make data say anything. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, I could, but, w you know. So, number one, you're not calling me a liar, are you? Like, you're not saying I've made this up completely, like. And, and also, like, I could do different things with this chart. I mean, I could have, you know, I could squish it and not be more pronounced. I don't know. You, you can manipulate it. You can change the scale. But I don't need to because that's 5 million. And that's, I don't know. So I, I think, but, but it depends on your culture and, like, is that valued? Or, um, like, in a university setting, maybe research and data is, you know, really sells, but in some other environment. What, what are you? Oh no, I just was curious. What's your uh, what's kind of, what's your vertical you work in? Um, well, technology. I do uh, work with people and hire. Okay. Them. Yeah, and and I, you might see a variety. I mean, really, what that drives things in government is politics, who calls whom, squeaky wheels, and things like that. That can that can um, win the day in the absence of anything else. And I think there often is an absence of, of anything else because, because there's not like profit to be made. Like there's like what's the incentive to do that work unless you just care, you know? Unless you, you know, and it, it might change over time um, as more like data data focused people maybe come into the workforce. Perhaps um, it might just change as our, our overall culture becomes more data centric. Um, but I think. It's going to be particularly challenging to introduce, introduce those ideas or to be a consultant and come in and introduce them. Like you kind of need an internal champion for them. We are definitely well over time. I, I'm happy to keep um, answering questions because there's no one, there's apparently no one scheduled after us. But, uh, I think there are maybe meetings for 11 15. 11 15. All right, so we probably close up. Thank you. Nice. Good job.